Good morning. I think that people will be trickling in, but I do want to get started because we have a very important topic, a wonderful panel, and we've got till 9.30 uh, to discuss a lot of important issues. Um, we really are fortunate to have been able to put together uh, just an extraordinary group of panelists on very short notice, and in fact, um, Scott Dowell is fresh off the plane from Geneva, so he can help to, you know, really give us data that's hot off the press. Um, but let me say at the outset that this is a, a, a special session that has been put together to address the unfolding uh, coronavirus outbreak. Obviously, this is an issue of huge concern, huge concern in terms of its impact on, on health and well-being, life and death, but also on the stability of communities and regions and countries, and also having huge economic and political reverberations as well. So it, it is an extraordinary moment in time to think about um, the nature of disease outbreaks, the importance of preparedness and response. How can we better understand the, the uh, organisms themselves and how they cause disease, how they spread, but also how can we think about uh, how the public health community and society more, more broadly can work together to be better prepared and hopefully, ultimately, to prevent outbreaks, outbreaks that begin in a given region and can spread, or the potential for other kinds of biological threats uh, that can, can threaten us, our health, and our security. So today we have with us, as I said, really an outstanding uh, group of people. I'll, I'll very quickly introduce them. I think that uh, longer bios are in your conference materials. But to my uh, immediate left is Scott Dowell, who's Deputy Director for Surveillance and Epidemiology in the Global Health Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a pediatric infectious disease spe specialist by training. He's really uh, now, uh, over many years, first working at the CDC and now at the Bill Gates uh, Foundation. Uh, become one of the international leaders on, on public health uh, preparedness and, and pandemic response, having worked overseas in Thailand building programs, worked at the CDC working nationally and internationally and working closely, as we'll hear, uh, with WHO as well. And uh, so he's going to start us off really framing the issue giving us an update on the outbreak and uh, really uh, identifying some of the critical issues of public health preparedness and response. He'll be followed by Dr. Trevor Bedford, who's an evolutionary biologist here in Seattle at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, and he really brings a very important and cutting edge perspective to this issue. He is using very powerful IT and data analytic approaches to really study the rapid spread and evolution of viruses. And he has been in his laboratory and probably also on the phone um, working on how to, to really understand the nature of this particular coronavirus, how it relates to the larger family of coronaviruses, thinking about uh, how it has evolved over time, potentially, how it may evolve in the future, and um, thinking about its potential origin. Uh, so I think we are very fortunate to have him right here in the backyard of the AAAS annual meeting, uh, but, but with this uh, really cutting edge knowledge. Then we're going to hear from John Cohen, who's joining us uh, on the big screen. Um, and many of you may know him because he's a staff writer for Science Magazine, and he's published widely in other magazines as well on topics of science, particularly biomedicine. Uh, he's long focused on HIV AIDS, uh, other infectious diseases, immunology, vaccines, and global health. 
and he's going to be able to inform us about the challenges of reporting on this unfolding outbreak. I think all of us are struggling to understand all the sources of information and you know, what to believe and, and what not to believe. And I think his perspective, as well as his insights uh, as a longtime and very informed science writer will be very valuable. And then finally, Jamie Yassif uh, will put all of this in a broader context of global health and security. And she's an NTI senior fellow in the Global Biological Policy and Programs uh, unit there. Uh, and she really has been spending most of her career working on global uh, catastrophic biological threats. Uh, she was also with Open Philanthropy, where she was able to fund uh, programs in this area. And she served as a uh, advisor, science and technology policy advisor at the US Department of Defense, uh, with a, originally training in biophysics at Berkeley. and. Um, and a BA in biology from Swarthmore College. So anyway, a very distinguished group representing different elements of what needs to be an integrated way of thinking about these kinds of biological threats. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn to the panel. We've got a lot of really fascinating content, and I want each panelist to have a chance to present to you. And then if there's time, We'll have some discussion amongst ourselves, and, and if there's time, we'll take questions from the audience. So, Scott? This is one of the most threatening outbreaks that I've seen in my career, and I wanted to take you through it. <clears throat> by looking at some of the faces of the people working on the front lines of dealing with this coronavirus that's now called COVID-19. This is Li Wenliang, who's a 34-year-old ophthalmologist from Wuhan. He was one of the earliest ones to identify this as a potential threat. He was a remarkable guy. He scored 690 on his exam that got him into medical school. So a very, very high score, very sharp guy. He uh, saw this cluster of pneumonias in people who came from the Wuhan seafood market and posted to some of his friends, his medical school colleagues, that this was a particularly dangerous one. People needed to be careful. The first test came back SARS-like that it was a SARS-like coronavirus, but on correction, it became clear that it wasn't actually SARS, it was closely related to SARS, and he posted um, increasing concern about this virus in the early days. At, at that time, it was a focus around the Wuhan seafood market, this large market that sold seafood and, and other things, and an, a number of the early cases came from that seafood market. The story was that there were 41 cases. It was this new coronavirus. It was not transmissible from person to person, that it was suspected to be an animal origin virus, and that it wasn't particularly severe. There were severe cases, but they were in the elderly and those with underlying conditions. Many of those early conclusions have proven not to be correct. I highlight Helen Branswell, who's a, a really sharp reporter here, as an example of one of the reporters. We'll hear from John Cohen later on, but people who really know science, who report well, and um, who get to the bottom of suspicious clusters like this one. Um, Helen was involved in the early reporting. Um, she had spent a stint at CDC, so she knew about epidemics and how they unfold. And, she also was one of the ones early on who interviewing a series of authorities said, you know, this thing is spreading so fast, it may be that it's not containable. And it may be that we have to shift from containment to mitigation, an issue that I'll come back to in a few minutes. This was the situation early in, in the reporting. You can see the, the dates on the bottom of this figure. Uh, from early to late January. And the numbers of cases in 
Wuhan and across mainland China just skyrocketing there. They stayed steady at 41, stubbornly at 41 for a week or a couple of weeks, and then they started to tick up. And once they started ticking up, the numbers went really crazy. And from our perspective, watching this thing closely, there wasn't a really good place to get the good numbers. We actually had to go to Helen Branswell and other writers to, who were doing the phone calling of lots of different people to put the numbers together to get an accurate picture of what was going on. I would like to think that WHO and others would have access to all of the numbers and could do that on a regular basis, but certainly at the beginning that was not the case. Keep this upsweep in the epidemic curve in mind as I come back to an issue of severity in a few minutes. It was in that context, as we watched this begin to unfold, that we went to Bill and Melinda <clears throat> and said, this is looking worse than previous ones. And we think an early commitment by the foundation is important. So very early on, I think it was the 25th of January, they said, yeah, let's commit $10 million. Um, and five million of those were go was going to Africa. Uh, we had recognized that in these epidemics, it's often the, the poor, the most marginalized, who get hit the hardest. And we figure it out again and again in retrospect. And so the intention here was early on in this one, Let's get the public health authorities in Africa the resources that they need to move quickly. But then also half of it went to China to help the folks on the front lines. It was uh, Melinda, they, they're, they're both really smart people. They both have big hearts. Melinda tends to speak when she speaks from the heart and she was the one who came out and said sort of with compassion, of course we need to be doing this. Thank you for moving quickly. And then a week or so later, as the data began to accumulate, and we started to recognize that this was not primarily an animal virus that was spilling over into human, but was a, was a humanly transmitted pathogen. And what's more, it was moving quicker than we'd seen most things before. Bill came back and said, yes, we should be putting tens of millions of dollars forward. And they approved a $100 million commitment um, about a week later. So an early commitment in three buckets. The first bucket was get fast, flexible funding to those on the front lines, the people in China CDC, World Health Organization, US CDC, and others who were trying to contain this thing. The second bucket was another 20 million, again, for the most vulnerable. Let's get money to those trying to serve the most vulnerable in Africa and South Asia and make sure that they are protected before this thing comes, or as, as protected as they can be. And the third bucket is 60 million towards product development. It's a traditional area of strength for the Gates Foundation, being able to develop products quickly, vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostic tests. And investing in this way was a, a signal in many ways that we believe we may be in this for the long run. Product development takes a long time. It can be accelerated, but it takes a long time. And so putting 60 million towards COVID product development implicitly implies that we think we're going to be dealing with this pathogen for a long time. I wanted to show Mike Ryan, who's an old friend. He's a, a, a seasoned epidemiologist. He's now Deputy Director General at the World Health Organization um, in charge of health emergencies. And so he's in charge, essentially, of the global response to this COVID-19. He's still cheerful despite having probably the worst job on the planet or the, one of the most difficult jobs, I should say. There, there's probably some people in Wuhan who would argue with me, but um, really difficult situation in WHO. Very fast moving epidemic. Um, they convened their emergency committee twice and it twice split on whether this should be declared a public health emergency even as we and others were seeing this thing skyrocketing and with some frustration. They are in the midst of this swirl of concern about economic damage and political repercussions and having to make these decisions in, in that context is really, really difficult. Gabriel Lung is a wonderful guy. He's actually a musician. He, uh, he conducts concerts. Um, but he's a, an epidemiologist uh, at his heart. He's uh, the dean of the School of Public Health at Hong Kong University. 
And in that position, he and his colleagues have access to some of the best data from China. They have access to the line list coming from China CDC. And they can do the really quick analyses on the really important questions that arose um, on this epidemic. The first one I've already alluded to is transmissibility. Is this virus transmissible from person to person, or was it an animal virus? Uh, early on, there was confusion. Now there's much, there should be no confusion. And one of the things that's measured to figure out transmissibility is the basic reproductive number shown here, or R0, you may have heard it uh, referred to. That's essentially measures the average number of people that each case infects. So if it's one, the outbreak stays steady. If it goes below one, you get the outbreak under control. And R0 of two is pretty robustly transmissible. This one you can see is centering around two and a half, depending on uh, the assumptions that you put in. I've seen estimates that go up to three, four, and as much as five. So there's no doubt that in the settings that this virus has been operating so far, this is a robustly transmitted human pathogen. And that accounts for that rapid upsweep in the number of cases that you saw in the earlier figure. The second question Gabriel focuses on, and this is probably the most important question right now, is severity. How bad is this thing? And the reason I say most important, because that drives all of the public health decisions. Whether you close schools, whether quarantine is justified, whether economically damaging travel bans should be Im implemented and are sustainable, all of this centers around how severe is this thing. And the simplest measure of severity is the CFR, or case fatality risk. And that's derived simply by dividing the numerator, the number of deaths, by the denominator, the number of cases. Here I've shown you yesterday's numbers, 1,369 deaths out of 46,997 cases. That even, it boggles my mind so quickly in this outbreak to have the numbers so high. That comes out to about 3%. It's, it's, it's worryingly high. It, it's gone up, actually, from a steady about 2% for the last week or so, and now it's started to creep up to 3%. We know that's wrong. Uh, and, and we know both the numerator is, is wrong and the denominator is wrong here. The numerator is wrong for an important reason, and that's why it's crept from 2 to 3%. The reason is that in, in, at this stage of a rapidly expanding outbreak, to put it bluntly, most people haven't had time to die. The big bulk of cases of those 46,000 people have been infected recently. The median time from exposure to death in the early cases that died was 18 days. So most of the people in that 46,000 have not had 18 days to either resolve their illness, we hope, or to die. So we know that that numerator is going to creep up as the outbreak catches up with itself. We hope that denominator is way underestimated. We know it's underestimated because laboratory confirmed cases are a subset of the cases out there. We, we, in, in Wuhan, they're, they're quite clear they, they don't have the resources or the time to test all of the cases, so lots are being missed. And what we're hoping is that a very large number of mild cases are being missed. And if you add that to the denominator, that brings down the case fatality ratio. The question is, is it five-fold underestimated or a hundred-fold underestimated? We hope it's at least a hundred-fold. If, if the denominator is a hundred-fold larger and we're missing this large iceberg under the tip that we're seeing, that would bring this down to 0.03 or so percent mortality. That puts it in the range of the 1957 influenza pandemic, which is still a bad situation. That 1957 was the second worst pandemic recorded. If it's five-fold underestimate, uh, underestimated, as, as some have projected, that's much more concerning because that puts it in the range of 1918, which was the worst pandemic in, in recorded history. So, there's a huge amount of uncertainty here. I'm not prepared to say what the, what the severity is, but it does, it, we, we are getting more and more certain with uh, every passing week, and it's centering around a rather severe human 
uh, pathogen. So I want to highlight Linda Stewart, who's at the Gates Foundation. She's one of those people who can really innovate. And I mentioned that 60 million of the 100 million is going towards product development. Uh, Linda has a particular expertise in vaccine product development. She was trained as a nephrologist in the UK, and she was not satisfied with that. Went back and got a PhD in microbiology, and then went to Harvard, where she was a professor, until the foundation recruited her to work on the discovery team. Linda knows a tremendous amount of vac about vaccines and vaccine development. There are now 37, at, at last I looked, uh, candidates in the pipeline, different approaches, some with the advantage of speed, but inability to scale, some with the advantage of ability to scale, but more likely takes several years to get them up, up and uh, running, so um, a big challenge. I come back to Li Wen Liang. This was a photo he posted on social media when he had gotten sick. He started getting uh, symptoms after examining a glaucoma patient, and um, he has a wife uh, and child, and his wife is pregnant with their second child. He, checked, he got a hotel room to check in because he didn't want to expose his family, but he got progressively more sick, and um, he had to go on a ventilator, and then went on ECMO uh, by reports and died. I believe it was February 7th total shock to those of us who have been following it and to people across China. There was an outpouring of grief across China and anger about the way that he had been treated early on by the, by the police <clears throat> for his reports. But to me, this is one of the turning points of this epidemic. It's the point where we acknowledge that it isn't just the elderly and those with underlying conditions. Yes, they're at higher risk, and, and that's been borne out by the data. But if it can strike down uh, a 34-year-old ophthalmologist, it should make us all pause and take it seriously. Inwo Lee is the head of our China office and a super sharp um, person with a, a real handle on the pulse of what's going on in China. And she was one of the ones early on when we were formulating the $100 million commitment who said, we realize that China has a lot of money and a lot of resources itself, but uh, the, the foundation's money can move very quickly, and that, that it's important for that reason. And the second reason is solidarity with the Chinese people and the people who are on the front lines. It's an important signal to send that this money is also for a frontline battle in China. And China has done extraordinary, extraordinary things. This figure I, I wanted to put up because it shows the impact of the quarantine on January 23rd, or thereabouts. What the figure shows on the x-axis is, is date, and the y-axis is a log scale of the number of cases exported from China to other countries. And it shows that blue line ticking up from one, two, three, up to 10 cases. Around that blue line are the red dots. Those are the actual observed numbers by day. So we were obser observing 10, 11, 12 cases per day being e exported from China up until around January 23rd. Then bang, the quarantine of Wuhan was put in place. Several airlines stopped flying in and out of Wuhan. More airlines followed suit. So the amount of travelers coming out of Wuhan dropped dramatically. The model in the blue line projects that it was going to drop down quickly and then start ticking back up again as travel continues. The red dots are interesting. They dropped down just as the model predicted. So we, we didn't see travelers from Wuhan exporting cases after that. What's interesting is they haven't started to tick up just yet. We're now February 14th, Valentine's Day. Um, so we should be up 10, 12 or so, according to this model, travelers uh, taking it out per day. We're not seeing that just yet. So it's early, time will tell, but um, the, the modeling says that the quarantine bought three to five days and then you're back on track again. It may be that the quarantine in combination with a range of social distancing measures in China have actually had a more of an impact than we thought. I want to come to protecting the most vulnerable. I've talked about it a couple times. John Kenkasong is, is head of the Africa CDC. He's a 
a PhD microbiologist. He ran the PEPFAR, the, the uh, president's uh, the AIDS re re relief laboratory branch for many years and supported laboratories across Africa and elsewhere for PEPFAR work until uh, a few years ago he went to Addis to launch and lead Africa CDC, one of these new organizations that we have a lot of hope and confidence in uh, leading the Africa public health response. So he and his teams have organized as a first priority getting laboratory diagnostic testing to countries in Africa so that they have the ability to detect these new coronaviruses coming in through airports, but uh, they've probably mostly come in through airports through that window and so now in uh, surveillance systems and hospitals and clinics. So here's the real question at this point. Is this thing containable or do we shift to mitigation? And this figure from the WHO situation report from yesterday gives a little bit of that answer. The epidemic curve is only those who have been exported from China, or, outs or cases outside of China. In the brown and orange and reddish colors are the ones that have a clear travel history to China. And so what you see is early on you saw a lot of exportation with people with clear travel history to China. But that curve has tailed off, as I mentioned. And with the quarantine and the restriction travel, we're seeing less of that. The question is, will those exported cases tick up? And we are seeing some of that. The pinks um, are some of the people who have no China travel history, but presumably acquired their infections from others in the countries who had contact with the first cases coming out. The blue ones are interesting. The blue ones are this, the people who are infected on that cruise ship off of Yokohama in Japan. I'm not sure what to make of that. The, a, a tremendous numbers of the cases outside of China are coming from this one cruise ship. Either there's something really unusual going on in the cruise ship and we, we haven't seen what that might be, or it's one of these finding your car keys under the street light that that's one of the places we can look the most carefully and that we're seeing a lot of spread there, which by implication would say we may be missing spread elsewhere. I'm gonna choose for the moment to hope that that cruise ship is an anomaly and ignore those blue bars and hope that the numbers of cases internationally are going down. And I'll leave you with this last slide. This is also from the sit rep from yesterday, but along the lines of that hope cautious optimism, I guess I'll call it. This looks at the 167 cases who had travel from China, and it says, did they transmit their infection and lead to chains of transmission, or did it fizzle out? And the good news is, from what can be told from these 167, most of them fizzled out, 147 without further transmission. 20 continued, and 13 of those clusters are ongoing. So those sparks created little fires which are now growing. But that's 20 out of 167, that's roughly one out of eight sparks that lead to a fire, or 13 out of 167, that's roughly one out of 12 that lead to significant fires. So as we think about how many of those cases were exported from China in that window, and set off little sparks around the world, how many do we think are going on, and is it possible with a robust public health response? We hope that those sparks have landed in places that have prepared, that have a robust public health response, and that can, can contain them. So I'll stop there and turn it over okay. to the next speaker. Thank you. Trevor? I always worry whether the technology will actually work. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing, I'm gonna do the thing that you're never supposed to do and give a live demo. Uh, but okay, this should be ready to go? Yes. Okay, so um, that, was, that was 
really clear-eyed. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so I want to talk about uh, kind of uh, genomic sequencing and how that can be applied to this outbreak to kind of have orthogonal data to what we'd normally be working with. So um, the sort of stuff that Scott was talking about where really a central thing that is used to understand epidemics are case counts. And so this is showing uh, data from two days ago of looking at cases in Hubei and, um, and deaths as well. And then we can kind of see how that's ticking up very rapidly. Uh, a couple days ago, we were up to 33,000 cases, and then, then it ticked up to 48,000. And that big tick in a single day was due to a change in case definition, where um, prior to this, it needed to have molecular confirmation that this was the um, had in COVID. Um, and then uh, because the kind of test kits were limited, it switched to just needing uh, uh, x-ray uh, showing pneumonia as well. And so this shows how kind of the definition of a case is very important and can be tricky to, uh, to harmonize across different health systems. And so this is something I think where the genomic side can really help to, uh, again, to harmonize things and have orthogonal data. So basically what this looks like in terms of using genetic sequencing to reconstruct pathogen spread, this is this toy example that I use a lot, where we have a number of individuals. They're infected by a particular uh, virus, a particular pathogen. They're, say, infected for a week or something like this, and they kick off a couple secondary infections, which then cause their own secondary infections. And so rather than looking at these as isolated cases, what we can do is we can take some of these individuals, swab their nose, and then sequence the virus that, that they're being infected with. You'll get about 30,000 letters for each of these uh, NCOV infections. And then you can look at this genome and, and find mutations that are shared between them. So we have this particular ATG, A2G change, for example, at a particular site out of this 30,000 letters, which is, say, this, uh, this purple mutation here that these two infections share. Uh, we have another mut orange mutation that these four different infections share, and this one blue mutation that is uh, unique to this infection. So you can use these, uh, these mutations to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree or a family tree that shows how these viruses are connected to one another. And so the idea here is that we can use this, uh, this phylogeny to understand something about the underlying uh, epidemic process. And this has proved a very uh, powerful technique. So uh, I believe this has been fairly revolutionary for understanding outbreaks, uh, just as a couple recent examples of work that we were involved with. Uh, if you look at uh, the Zika epidemic in the Americas, uh, basically that was highly cryptic, where it was circulating with a lot of asymptomatic cases not being looked for. Uh, whereas after the kind of genomic data came in uh, later on, that was able to pin down an origin uh, into early 2014, and then uh, into northeastern Brazil, and then spread through the Americas from that single introduction in northeastern Brazil from French Polynesia. And so data that we would, a story that would have no other way except from the gen genomic data. Uh, we also uh, were able to see drivers for the West African Ebola epidemic uh, through, this, uh, through this kind of novel data stream. So, most of this work has been uh, retrospective. So if we, and kind of getting more, more and more perspective, more and more timely as things have gone on, but if we go back just four years and look at uh, Ebola in West Africa, this is a, a figure by um, Gita Studis and Andrew Rambo, where uh, the kind of uh, blue ticks here are showing and green ticks are showing when uh, samples were collected, and then these open circles are showing when their genomes were shared publicly. The sequencing went on kind of between these two, um, these two extremes, exactly don't know when things came off the machine, but basically it was uh, a year-long kind of turnaround from a sample being collected to a sequence being shared. And so this made all of this analysis pretty academic, where you can, you can learn something about the outbreak, but it's after the outbreak has more or less finished. And um, however, we've been trying to kind of uh, improve things. So, uh, I've been basically relying on all of the technology and the lab stuff to get better and better, which it has. And we've been working on this kind of side of if there is genomic data shared, how can we make kind of the computational machinery turn around really quickly and be able to do the analyses in a timely fashion? And so if you think about what this requires is we need just very things to happen very quickly, timely analysis and sharing results. Dissemination must be scalable. Um, emailing PDFs around is, I think, not the right solution. Uh, we want to be able to integrate across many data sources, and really um, important and challenging is we want results that must be easily interpretable and queryable by people who aren't experts in genomic epidemiology. And so what we've been working on for the past four or so years um, 
Uh, it's first with just me and Richard Nair, who's a close colleague in all of this, at the University of Basel, um, when it was Next Flu, and then it's expanded to be Next Strain as we've kind of tried to work with more and more things. And then folks in our labs, particularly James, Emma, and Tom, have really uh, contributed to, um, to the coding. And so the basic idea here is to do kind of an open source analysis of pathogenomic data rather than uh, um, trying to publish papers. Instead, we uh, are able to pull in genomic data as it appears to these databases and provide a real-time view of what things look like. And it's kind of maybe similar to thinking of a weather report, where as data comes in, we're going to kind of provide a continually updated view of, of what things look like. Uh, so just diving right in to, um, so on January 10th, there was a uh, first genome released by researchers at Fudan University. This is Professor Zhang's group. Uh, that, um, that was from novel coronavirus. This was a sample that was collected in late December. So then this is now from a sample collected in late December to a, a genome for a novel pathogen in just, uh, just over two weeks. And then uh, we could see in this, um, from this first genome that it's a SARS-like beta coronavirus. So the uh, dot here in red is showing the novel coronavirus. Uh, it's part of beta coronavirus diversity. So up here we have MERS, which uh, is, uh, has been circulating in the Middle East and um, the Arabian Peninsula since 2012. It exists in camels, and then there are repeated spillover events into humans, and then in those spillover events, in humans, the r naught of the virus, as Scott was talking about, is less than one. So all of those transmission chains just peter out naturally, fortunately. Uh, we have another couple lineages of OC43 and HKU01. These are actual seasonal coronaviruses. So there have been four coronavirus pandemics in the last 70 years. We didn't notice that there were pandemics because basically everyone got a common cold. And these four uh, seasonal viruses have circulated ever since and have caused, caused about 30% of the common colds uh, year to year. And so we have these, yeah, these two lineages that are now human associated after these spillover events. Um, basically, deeper in the tree is all bat diversity, where kind of all of the actual diversity exists. And then down at the bottom of the tree in orange, we see SARS-like viruses. I'm going to kind of zoom in there. And so uh, here we have uh, the kind of zoom in of SARS-like viruses, where purple is showing uh, viruses that are collected from bats. So you can see this large genetic reservoir of genetic diversity in bats as these viruses are just naturally circulating. Uh, we have the SARS epidemic, or the SARS outbreak of 2002-2003 in humans here, but you can see that there's a kind of a civet cat intermediary where things um, jump through. And then down at the bottom of the page, we have novel coronavirus where there were, uh, where the closest relative is this bat genome. So this is a coronavirus uh, collected from a bat in a cave in Yunnan that is different at 2% of its genome. Uh, you can do kind of the calculation based upon the molecular clock and the rate of evolution of coronaviruses. To, um, to see that this had a common ancestor roughly between 20 and 70 years ago. So we know that this coronavirus was in a bat 20 to 70 years ago. We don't know exactly where it's been since. Uh, the most likely scenario is some, is, uh, is some animal intermediary that kind of was a fairly recent thing that happened and then spill over into humans, similar to the civet virus, the civet case. Okay, so then on January 11th, we had four additional genomes that were released from the China CDC. So basically, we had five genomes on uh, January 11th, and this allowed us to kind of look at early outbreak dynamics. All of these were sampled in late December, and the kind of first thing that we could see is that there was just very little genetic diversity, that three out of the five were completely genetically identical at all 30,000 bases in the genome, and then the additional two were differed at only three mutations uh, each, uh, some of which may have been sequencing errors. And so this, uh, this told us very quickly that what these five cases are very closely linked. Uh, we know that these, uh, that coronaviruses mutate at about maybe one or two um, mutations per genome per month. So this lets us know that all of these infections uh, share a common origin in the last two weeks or one month before this. Uh, when, um, when I and others saw this, um, my initial first thought was that this isn't so scary. This is, ep this is uh, clustering duty epi investigation. These five individuals came from the market, they all were exposed to the similar source, and so that wasn't, that wasn't so worrisome to me at the time. But then what happened is we had on January 17th an additional two um, novel coronavirus genomes that were, that were shared from these um, Bangkok travel exports, and then in both those cases there was no reports of market exposure. 
And here then we saw that in both those cases, the genetic diversity was identical, suggesting that their kind of exposure history came from a common source as well that was recent. And so then the kind of most like the explanation for this is some introduction to humans, human human spread that eventually gets you to these travel export cases. I was already looking kind of looking quite bad here. And then on January 19th, there are additional five uh, genomes released from Wuhan that kind of still showed this lack of genetic diversity. And this is kind of for me when the other shoe dropped and I freaked out. <laughs> and, um, and then kind of realized that there's this, there is this single introduction in the human population. We can use this molecular clock to date things between November 15th and December 15th, and then just human human spread since that point. And this is something where, again, this orthogonal data stream on January 19th was saying something that was at that point quite different from what the uh, other data sources were saying, where at January 19th, 19th it was still limited human human transmission, repeat zoonoses, whereas genomic data was saying very clearly at that point that there's rampant human human spread. So I think that's, that's a key thing to, to note. Um, so yeah, I spent the week of January 20th alerting various public health officials, everyone that I know. And then um, since then, we basically aim to just keep this nextstrain.org updated within one hour of new sequences being shared. Uh, all of the sharing is now happening, and this has been kind of a remarkable thing that's been going on, that all of the sharing is happening this gisaid.org uh, uh, website. Uh, this was created in response to um, kind of data sharing concerns surrounding avian flu, but it's been a kind of a nice neutral place to house this data and they've been acting to kind of curate things. In just the month from January 10th, we've had over 100 sequences shared by groups from all over the world. This is public health institutions like China CDC, provincial CDCs within China, um, the uh, equivalent CDC, US CDC, Korea CDC, et cetera, the CDCs of the world, as well as academic groups like KU Leuven, University of Helsinki, that are all kind of doing the sequencing and contributing together. And that's been remarkable that we have so much data so quickly. And then now um, we're hitting these three to six day turnarounds in, the, um, in many cases, where a sample will be collected from someone, got into the lab, will be sequenced, and will be put to the public database in just three days is currently the, currently the record, uh, which has never been seen before. And it's something kind of an inflection point for the field where we can actually use this genomic data in a much more actionable fashion to understand things as they're occurring rather than just retrospectively. So uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna give a bit of a live demo. Uh, so, here. So here's the current view of things. Uh, we can see this is the uh, kind of our estimate of a time tree. Again, we have early outbreak in, er in December that occurs that's showing up just in Wuhan. And then after that point, you start seeing samples elsewhere in Wuhan. So these are the first samples that come in in later December. And then um, we start to see samples uh, coming in elsewhere in China. And then we start to see things appear kind of far-flung places in the world. Almost all of these things that we do have are direct exports or they, or the, for things that are sequenced, or they're part of short transmission chains. For example, if we zoom in here, uh, we can look at these two cases that were sequenced from Paris where they're genetically identical. And we know also from their kind of exposure history that they're, they're epi-linked. And so the kind of genome data supports that. Uh, for the most part, however, we're seeing that if we look, say, let's take a toy example, and we look at, uh, at the US, that, uh, that basically everything is coming in separate. And there are all these kind of separate introductions from, from Wuhan, except for these kind of very closely epilinked cases. We're not seeing community transmission yet, but it's something that we can be looking for in kind of uh, in a very detailed fashion here. Um, also um, interesting is we can look at other things like host. We had recently a couple uh, genomes come in that were taken from environmental samples from the Huanan seafood market. Those uh, cluster with the very early cases in, in Wuhan and kind of confirm that maybe not as the um, uh, original, original source, but definitely as a kind of important foci for, um, for infection. Uh, I think that is most of the demo that I'll give. Uh, Okay, so we're basically trying to keep that, that updated. That is largely descriptive, so we're seeing these geographic patterns. It can help with contact tracing. So each time a new um, sequence comes in from the CDC, we ping them to kind of let them know how this, how this fits with things. Uh, but we can also kind of go another step and try to use more of this kind of mathematical modeling to get um, 
underlying estimates out of things. And so this is this field of uh, kind of narrow field called phylodynamics. And uh, what we can do is we can make kind of, again, some of these detailed estimates. So we, in this case, if we uh, look at the uh, uh, mutation rate, again, we get about two mutations uh, per genome per month. This puts a common origin of the infections that we do have in late, December, late November, early December. And we can use that, use the amount of kind of genetic diversity that's accruing over time and how quickly branches find a common ancestor to estimate the underlying viral population size. This is a, a technique that's developed over many years in the field of population genetics. And basically, we can see an exponential increase in the viral population size by just looking at the tree. This doesn't look at case data at all. It only looks at the 88 genomes that we do have at the moment. We can see this exponential increase in the effective population size. We can use some assumptions and some math to convert this that I don't want to fully get into. Uh, we can convert this into an estimate of point prevalence. We're estimating on February 8th, tens of thousands, up to 100,000 people currently infected. Again, this is just from the 88 genome sequences that we have. And we can then turn that into an estimate of total incidence that is on the order of 200,000 uh, infections, uh, global uh, total infections by uh, February 8th. And so that, that is not going to kind of answer the question all by itself, but I think it's an interest, a helpful way to address this kind of uh, underlying denominator that Scott was talking about. Uh, so one thing that I want to emphasize, and that's been kind of really, um, really uh, humbling here and rewarding, is just how different the scientific communication surrounding the outbreak has been. So everything is now completely flipped. It's being posted by our archive. Everything's being posted by our archive. Modeling groups are posting live analyses via GitHub and other mechanisms. There's a crowdsourced line list of a Google Doc with tens of thousands of lines that people are hacking together on to kind of uh, try to record a, a line list for um, scientific groups to work with. Uh, this has made something that the kind of communication between academics and public health officials has spilled over to the larger um, interest from general public, which has been interesting and, and challenging. And I think this is something that, I, that John may talk about, but I wanted to allude to a bit here. So, uh, so there's this paper that came out on um, January 31st that was rather terrible. Um, I think it was from a not malicious, just confused group that, uh, that they did an alignment of SARS versus novel coronavirus, found small regions of like seven amino acids that had an indel um, between them, blasted that against the database and found matches to HIV. You could, uh, and then declared that this was uh, possibly an engineered virus. Uh, this was wrong in many levels. Uh, these, uh, these indels exist across all of these bat viruses. If you do the blast, you come up with hits across the tree of life. This was quickly debunked by scientists. There was this very, um, very enthusiastic uh, peer review that happened, uh, and BioArchive had like 40 reviews of this paper, kind of all showing how wrong it was. And so it was quickly retracted in BioArchive, and the kind of the scientific literature did exactly what it should do, and you had the science moving very quickly, which is awesome. But this also meant that kind of this uh, conspiracy theory just started to have its own legs in the public domain. So then I've been trying to kind of debunk these things via Twitter and trying to kind of figure out how to, how to combat this. And this, is, this kind of misinformation side has been hugely, hugely challenging. Um, with that, I'd like to basically close thinking about moving forward. Uh, I agree with these r not estimates of two to three, doubling time of like six days. Currently, a key thing is looking at the huge Herculean intervention measures that China's undertaken and how much that's actually going to bring down r not. We really need this um, question of severity answered. Uh, there's different ways to do this, but I think that's, that's something that is hugely important. And then I think for the genomic data, the most immediately useful thing will be to uh, really look for emerging uh, community transmission. And with that, um, I'll stop and really thank these amazing um, data sharing from all over the world. And I'm happy to turn over the next talk. Well, thank you, Trevor. And I think that you have demonstrated both how advances in technology have enabled us to better understand what's going on in an outbreak context and, and think about the future. You've also shown how advances in technology have also complicated the landscape in some ways in terms of the rapid spread of information, um, some of which is very accurate and highly technical and some of which is not. And that in some ways is the perfect segue for our next speaker, John Cohen,
who I hope uh, will be joining us. There he is. Um, uh, to talk about the challenges of reporting on this, being able to translate these advances in science um, to both professional and public audiences, but also to sift through um, this, this uh, rapid fire unfolding of information uh, and assess what needs to be reported and what should be filed away forever. So John. Yeah, it's, it's apropos to follow Trevor, who has helped me a great deal, and I've followed NextGen closely. I work with a team of reporters, and we basically have been doing this 24-7 because we're in different parts of the world. We, we, have had, we have someone in China who's now in Japan. We have uh, someone in Berlin. We have someone in Amsterdam, and I'm the editors in D.C. And so we're all trying to drink from the fire hose. And you know, Trevor's exactly right. This is moving more quickly uh, in terms of information flow, and some have called it an infodemic um, than ever before. I've covered outbreaks for years. I've never had this much information hitting me at, at once. And it's Trevor's nextstrain.org, it's virological.org, it's GISAID, it's GitHub, GitHub, it's Twitter, and it's keeping up with the other media. And there's a tremendous amount to, to go through. And in my job and the job of the team I work with is to figure out not simply what's possible, what's probable and what's new, what's telling people things they don't know. Um, and that the speed at which we're moving, you make more mistakes when you're moving quickly. That's, that's the way it goes. And we're following a research community that as with all outbreaks is in, there is a fog of outbreaks. And that fog is they don't really know where this began. They don't really know how transmissible it is. They don't really know how severe it is. And they're trying to gauge these things and we're trying to keep up with it. And I just wanted to point out some of the issues that we have wrestled with that have been difficult to report. Um, China is uh, not open and transparent as much as they discuss being open and transparent, and it's much better than it's been in the past. But if you watch WHO's press conferences or the US CDC's press conferences, Hong Kong has done these as well. They're daily, they're open, journalists get to ask questions. That's not happening out of China. And my sources in China are largely reluctant to speak. And so there's been a great communication gap between the Chinese researchers in the front and journalists around the world. And there, I, I would love to go to China. I have not received an invitation from China to go there to report this. It's difficult to report from where I sit in San Diego because I really want to be in China, um, to be on the ground. The way we learned that this was a new coronavirus was from a Wall Street Journal article on, the, on, on January 8th. That's not right. The way the first sequence came out on January 10th uh, came after there was a concern that sequences were being held up because of publication concerns people had. And that's not right. And part of what journalism does is it puts a spotlight on things that are uncomfortable at times. And that we hope by putting a spotlight on it, we can help make things more clear than, than they would be otherwise. Uh, we have uh, struggled with covering the idea of, is this a public health emergency of international concern? I think a lot of researchers were, were surprised that it wasn't declared a public health emergency of international concern when the emergency committee met and had a split vote, spent another day on it, and then a week later it becomes a public health emergency of international concern. And, and with that, WHO says there should not be any travel restrictions. And then country after country has travel restrictions. And there's an article in The Lancet that just came out from global health legal scholars criticizing countries and saying that this is not what the international health regulation and the public health inter emergency of international concern means. But you don't hear much of this dialogue happening at the upper levels because Politics influence everything here. It's not simply about the science. We've seen a great deal of confusion about the origin. Trevor has helped me work through this. Um, he mentioned 
this HIV and this conspiracy theories. There have been conspiracy theories about a lab in Wuhan that is the central lab that studies bat viruses and bat coronaviruses. And there have been, you know, concerns that it somehow spilled over or was a lab accident. We've had to confront those. There's no evidence of that. Is it possible? Everything's possible. Is it probable? No. And then the seafood market has been the central focus because certainly something happened there. There was a cluster there, but then a paper came out and said the first case was December 1st and wasn't connected to the seafood market. And then another paper came out and said four of the five first cases weren't connected to the market. So these are the sort of questions that journalists can spotlight and ask what's really going on. Even though they don't have solid answers, um, the sequence data that, that Trevor has been beautifully diagramming has helped me to understand the evolution and then to think more clearly about if it took 20, at least 20 years uh, between that bat virus that we know is most closely related to this new virus, uh, the intermediaries, is it a pangolin? That's the latest uh, lead that it's a pangolin. Well, what do we know? We know there was a press conference held in China at a university where they said they had up to 99% similarity, but there are no data, none, zero. So I don't know. And, and then as journalists, because we're looking for things that are new, a lot of people jump on it as this is, this is the answer, this is the story. And I'm always, and with the team I work with, we're always taking a deep breath and asking, what's real? What, what do we go with? And how do we clarify things? I, I have a lot of uh, questions about how we came to learn that there was human to human transmission. I mean, we were hearing, we were checking the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission daily reports day after day in early January. They kept saying there was no, they shut down the seafood market, there was no human to human transmission. And we did a story early on where we quoted Jeremy Farr from um, the Welcome Trust saying, this isn't, this isn't over. You know, that there probably is human to human transmission. It was, it was kind of daring for Jeremy at that moment to say it because it cut against the information that was publicly being promoted. And, and that again and again is our challenge in covering outbreaks. What is being said publicly versus what are the data saying? And as Trevor pointed out, data speak. They speak loudly and they speak more loudly than public pronouncements and what officials have to say. And so my challenge again and again is to hear that data and to hear it quickly and early and to sift through the, the, the find the signal in a great deal of noise. I think the um, questions for the future have to do with treatments and how those are going to be evaluated and rolled out. Um, if the past is any indication of what's gonna happen again, um, there probably are gonna be problems with the trials of the drugs that are being tested. They're, they're said to be uh, controlled, placebo-controlled, randomized trials of remdesivir and of Lepon, uh, uh, ritonavir and lopinavir. Are they? Um, again, I, we need to see data. We need to have communications with the people at the front. And I'm frustrated that it's not happening um, with more clarity and more transparency. And there are loads of great people who are helping us figure this out. Please don't misunderstand me. Uh, I, I rely on the people at the front to help me figure things out. But, it, but it's a challenge and it will remain a challenge um, for as far as I can see. Thank you. Well, certainly I think all of our speakers so far have have helped us to understand the complexity of this outbreak, the, the challenges of getting the data that's needed, the challenges of actually acting on that data, and also the fact that an outbreak anywhere actually matters to us everywhere in ways that are, are powerful uh, and uh, very profound. Our last speaker is gonna really try to put all of this into a a larger context, help us perhaps find our way through the fog of this outbreak, um, recognizing that this isn't the first outbreak of this kind to occur, and it likely won't be the last. So how can we think about 
uh, global health and security in a more sustainable and enduring way. So, Jamie. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, I would like to, to thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to participate in this really important conversation, and thanks to all of you for coming and listening uh, early this morning. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, this novel coronavirus, um, and my title is as, uh, it's the latest battle in a series of, of global health security challenges. As Peggy said, it's not the first, and it won't be the last. Um, so I'm gonna make, over the next uh, 15 minutes, I'll make four key points. One, just to state the obvious, um, this is not the first uh, epidemic or pandemic with global impact, and it won't be the last. Um, the world is not prepared to prevent and respond to pandemics uh, on a global scale, um, and we need to take a lot of actions to change that. So um, governments, development banks, and philanthropic organizations need to make more sustained investments in pandemic preparedness, both in the US and globally. Um, and the US and the international community should develop concrete plans for responding to very large scale pandemics um, that are perhaps larger scale than the one we've seen in recent history. Uh, so just to elaborate on the first point, um, you know, this is, this is part of a sequence of events. We've, uh, in recent years, we've ex experienced the H5N1 um, flu pandemic, the Ebola out two Ebola outbreaks in recent years, uh, Zika outbreak, um, now we have novel coronavirus. Um, and this inter the international community is going to uh, likely continue to face these types of large-scale biological events going forward, uh, many of them probably from natural sources, but other sources are also possible, including deliberate or accidental events. Pa pandemics pose threats not only to global public health, but they have a variety of knock-on effects. Um, they, they can threaten economic and political stability as well as international security, and we've seen that, we start to see that in the news. And while progress has been made to identify the, the gaps in our pandemic preparedness globally since the Ebola outbreak in West Africa of 2014, we haven't seen the sustained political will and incentives to spend money and time filling those gaps. And what we need is a sustained effort focused on building pandemic preparedness capacity in the, internet, in the US and internationally, and we need to escape what, what, uh, what people in the community often refer to as a cycle of panic and neglect. Right now we're in the cycle of panic, there's a large scale outbreak, we're getting ready to spend lots of money to, to contain this outbreak, but as the years pass, um, uh, memories are short and we, we stop paying attention and the resources dry up and then we, end, we re repeat the cycle every few years. So second point, the world is not prepared to prevent and respond to pandemics. So Exhibit A is a project that we at NTI did in collaboration with, with the Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security as well as the Economist Intelligence Unit. And so this was an indexing of uh, pandemic preparedness capacity across a wide variety of indicators using publicly available data from 195 countries. And the bottom line, as you can see in the map, but the bottom line and the key takeaway from this, uh, this report is that national health security is fundamentally weak in countries around the world. No country is fully prepared for epidemics or pandemics, and every country has important gaps. Uh, the total perfect score is 100 on this index, um, but the average overall score for countries was 40.2, which is a failing grade. And that's reflected in the map. So we, we deliberately decided to give yellow for more prepared, um, sorry, most prepared, orange for more prepared and least prepared to red. Uh, it, it was indicated in red. We didn't get anyone a passing grade. No one got a green. Um, so this was, the, this was the first index of its kind. It was released in 2019 in, in October. And it was actually um, a pretty big deal that this happened because we've ne never been this, this is a huge challenge from a data pr uh, collection perspective and it's also um, somewhat politically challenging. This is the first time countries have com been compared in this sort of systematic and open source way. But we think that there's tremendous potential to draw attention to the greatest needs so we can, can prioritize investments to, to be most effective for reducing risk. So um, this, this index is available online. Um, you, you can look at all the data, um, but there's been also been a lot of press coverage. And so the way that the Washington, Washington, recent Washington Post editorial framed it, the world is flunking the fight against disease, reflecting the fact that most countries on average are getting a failing grade. 
So uh, there are a number of key findings from this report. I'll share a few examples. Uh, most countries lack foundational health system capacities that are vital for epidemic and pandemic, uh, pa and epidemic and pandemic response. The average score is uh, about 26 out of 100. More than half of countries face major political and security risks that could undermine national capability to counter biological threats. Uh, there is little evidence that most countries have tested important health security capacities or shown that they would be functional in a crisis. So what that means is that a number of countries have the ingredients to have effective systems, but there hasn't necessarily been a demonstration or a test to show that they will work um, during a crisis and they will deliver the desired result. And finally, most countries are not dedicating money from their national budgets to fill identified uh, pandemic preparedness gaps. So this, I'll just give a very brief uh, summary of the structure of this index so you get a sense of what kind of questions we were asking. We were looking across prevention, detection, and response ca capacity, but we're also looking at um, other indicators including the underlying health system, um, to what extent does the, does the country in question follow norms internationally for, uh, for preventing responding pandemics, and are they uh, making fun financial commitments, and then what is the underlying risk environment that either drives the risk up or down of a, if there is an outbreak that it will be able to be controlled or not. Uh, this, is the, this is the structure of the index, so for each of these six categories, there are a number of, of questions uh, from four to about seven. Um, and this is just to make the point that this is a huge lift in terms of data collection. We benchmarked 195 countries, over 27,000 data points were collected. We looked at 5,000 uh, documents, over 100 researchers are involved, uh, approximately 50 languages spoken by the researchers, and it was over 15,000 hours of research to create this index. So it's a really a, a monumental achievement that we're very excited about. Uh, so um, I'm going to move on to, to part three, which is uh, not just admiring the problem, but thinking about solutions. So uh, a key point is that governments, development banks, and philanthropic organizations need to make sustained investments in pandemic preparedness in the U.S. and globally, uh, as opposed to this cycle of pa uh, panic and neglect where you respond when there's an outbreak and then you forget when there isn't, because that just doesn't work. So from a domestic perspective, so one thing that's notable here in the United States is that uh, there was 2015 um, Ebola funding for hospital preparedness in the US just to make sure that we can contain outbreaks that are emerging here. Um, but this, this funding is expiring and we don't yet have a, a replacement for it. So one recommendation is that we need a more sustainable financial model for epidemic and pandemic preparedness within hospitals in the US and also the broader health system, including clinics and more distributed care centers. And just uh, at, a, at a more basic level, funding to enhance US public health preparedness is inadequate and it needs ongoing support. So one thing I'll note from the, the index earlier is that the United States um, does score, has the highest score out of all the 195 countries that were assessed in the index, but we still um, are not funding to the level that we need to be, and we have huge gaps in our own capacity to prevent pandemics here at home. We also need to invest globally. Uh, so there are a number of, of financing recommendations. Uh, one of them is about a global health security challenge fund or matching fund. This has been uh, recommended by NTI and our partners as part of the Global Health Security Index recommendations. Uh, our colleagues in the CSIS Health Security Commission, which Peggy participates in, um, have also recommended something along these lines. Uh, NTI has also recommended that the UN Secretary General should call together a high-level heads of state bio-threat summit that's focused on health security financing and new international emergency response capabilities. Because of this cycle of panic ne and neglect, because this isn't prioritized in a systematic way, the, uh, there, we're missing focused attention at the highest levels of government in, in the international community to solve these problems in a systematic way and to, to build the, the systems and tools that we really need uh, to, to take this on for the, long, for the long haul. I also wanted to share, um, in addition to financing, there's a lot of other capacity that we need to focus on building. These are some key takeaways from a recent brief that came out 
<coughs> from a, a group of organizations that came together to, uh, with, with expertise in pandemic preparedness and biosecurity to think about, in light of the current outbreak, what are the things that we need to be doing now concretely to bolster our ability to, uh, to contain this outbreak? So a variety of organizations were involved, the Center for Global Development, Georgetown University, uh, our colleagues at NTI, InQtel, UNMC, and others. And so I don't have time to get into all of these detailed recommendations. It is available online, but I'll highlight a few uh, just for the purpose of discussion. So one, we need to scale up support for frontline healthcare workers. Uh, this, uh, this should uh, take you know, for example, take the form of training and guidance on screening, case management, and infection prevention. We also need to provide guidance and tools on how to provide surge capacity in the, in the case of crisis situations. We currently don't have strong mechanisms or guidance for, for surging. And one, one anecdote I would share is that in, in New York City hospitals, New York City is, is one of the best prepared places in the United States. For pandemic, for pandemic events, and even for a normal flu season, their hospitals are over 100% capacity just from the flu outbreak. So that's not even taking into account this. So if we had anything approaching the scale um, in the US of what's going on in China, our systems would be under tremendous strain. Second, uh, pr pursue additional manufacturing capability and reinforce existing supply chains for a variety of essential medical and protective goods, including PPE and, and critical medical supplies. Um, so a lot of folks are, are talking about personal protective equipment at this point, and that's definitely something we need to focus on. But I would also note in this context um, that we have an interdependent global supply chain for precursors for lots of uh, pharmaceuticals that we rely on, and in fact, China is one of the key sources for precursors for pharmaceuticals that we need here in the U.S., so as this outbreak uh, moves forward, we're going to see strain on that system, we're going to have to figure out how to manage it. Third, to the point of, uh, of managing misinformation that, that a couple of folks on the panel have mentioned so far, um, it's really critical to communicate regularly to the public through trusted experts. Uh, as these pandemics or epidemics escalate, there's a real risk of fear and panic and misinformation and disinformation, and you, the, the public health community needs to be very proactive in communicating reliable, frank information in order to keep that under control. To an earlier point, we need to assess urgent vulnerabilities in the developing world. So a virus that can strain a health system uh, like China's, is, is likely to pose enormous challenges to health systems in, in poor and underdeveloped countries. And if diseases can spread in areas with weak pandemic preparedness, we are not safe in any country in the world. We're only as secure as our, our weakest link. So one recommendation that we've put forward is that the U.S. should partner with other donors, including development banks and philanthropies, uh, as well as the WHO, to bolster pandemic preparedness in these resource-poor settings where there is the greatest need. We also need to support coordinated international action. So we've put forward from NTI a recommendation that the UN Secretary General and WHO Director General should jointly convene a, a special Security Council meeting to harmonize international action on the outbreak and consider setting up a standing coordination and leadership platform for managing high consequence biological events within the UN Secretary General's office. We also need to support research and innovative technologies. So this is relevant to the developing, testing, and manufacturing of medical countermeasures. Um, and these are, these are all likely to be rate-limiting steps. I mean, we've heard that it's likely to be at least a year before medical countermeasures are, are getting to the point where they can be tested and, and manufactured. But, but there are multiple, there will continue to be multiple rate-limiting steps after that, and investment in science and technology and innovation now can help reduce those rate-limiting steps. Innovation is also critical to, to other, other tools that can help us manage these risks, including digital health platforms, point of care diagnostics, and the kind of data tools that Trevor has been talking about that have been proved to be so valuable in, in this outbreak. 
And um, as uh, to the point about managing, reducing rate limiting steps to, for, for dispensing uh, and getting medical countermeasures out to those who need it, we also need to develop new partnerships and, and revisit our plans to make sure that when medical countermeasures are ready to go, we can actually get them to people. Uh, this is likely going to involve a public-private partnership, um, and this is not a solved problem in the U.S., and it's not a solved problem globally. So my last point is just that we, we need to develop concrete plans for responding to larger scale pandemics in the long term. So uh, this is a, a study that, that we at NTI are working on in partnership with our colleagues at the Center for Global Development, and there are a few basic premises here, or working hypotheses for this project. One, you can't assume that medical countermeasures measures will be available within the first year. It might even take longer, as we're seeing now with the coronavirus outbreak. Second, current pandemic preparedness plans do not scale. These approaches are going to break down in the face of large case counts, uh, numbers that we can reasonably anticipate from future pandemics. And in fact, um, this, this is true for both naturally emerging infectious disease outbreaks as, whether, as well as the potential for accidental release or deliberate release events. And it's, and it's likely, I think we're likely to see much larger biological scale events in the future. So we're still, uh, we're still doing the research to undergird these working hypotheses and make, make them ground in the literature. Uh, but I wanted to share a few uh, quotes from prominent figures in the field to, to undergird these points. So from the head of the WHO, a, a devastating epidemic can start in any country at any time, kill millions of people because we're not prepared and because we're still vulnerable. Bill Gates has noted recently that a fast-moving airborne pathogen could kill more than 30 million people in less than a year. And there is ample evidence that pandemic flu can cause on the order of a billion cases, and we've seen that in recent years. So what should we do about it? So in, as part of this project, we're, we're evaluating how the US and the international community can develop pilot policy guidance for responding to large-scale biological events when normal health systems become overwhelmed. This is not some, I don't wanna be fear-mongering, this is not where we are right now with a novel coronavirus, but it's important to plan for these kinds of contingencies. So the recommendation is that the US government should outline contingency plans for mitigating mass-scale domestic disease transmission and providing mass-scale isolation and treatment. This includes developing clear mechanisms for distributed care, including home diagnosis, home care, and isolation, and clear guidance to local authorities for social distancing measures. And the reason this is so important is because one of the, most imp one of the best ways to, um, in the absence of a, a vaccine or other medical countermeasures, one of the best ways to stop disease transmission is to separate people, to get the, the transmission rate down. But if we have a centralized healthcare system that relies on people going to hospitals or large facilities, that's going to be very challenging. So we need to think about a different model when the numbers get really big. In order to facilitate this, uh, this uh, approach to containing uh, outbreaks and epidemics, we, also, we need to do a variety of things. Uh, that includes medical technology investments and innovation to facilitate distributed care at home. It's also going to require the development of policy, legal, and ethical frameworks uh, to situate, this, to this, to situate this, this new approach. We'll need federal and state health authorities to review the crisis thresholds at which these measures will be triggered, meaning what are the cri exact criteria? When will we know that we can shift from a business as usual, centralized hospital approach to managing an epidemic to a distributed care model where, where everyone, where you change your strategy? And more generally, uh, we need to clearly define the thresholds that should trigger a strategy change in response operations. How do we know when it's not business as usual? How can we tell from case counts or fatality rates or impacts on the health system or other indicators so that we can be better prepared if, if, uh, if these kinds of pandemics in the future uh, uh, are larger and overwhelm our systems? So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we have covered a lot of ground. I think, you know, certainly one theme has emerged about the importance of really uh, having data that can be relied on, whether it's at the most fundamental genomic level, um, at the level of really uh, understanding the nature and scope of the outbreak as it unfolds and where it may be going, 
and data about the preparedness of countries and um, the fact that we really do need to build capacity everywhere in the world because a problem anywhere is a problem everywhere, potentially, and certainly these uh, viruses and, and other microbes uh, know no borders, and we really do need to have uh, data, uh, clarity, transparency, sharing, and accountability moving forward. Uh, I was glad you raised the issue about medical countermeasures, because as we were talking, I realized we hadn't really talked about that. And, think how different this outbreak would be if we actually, from the beginning, had a point-of-care diagnostic that was cheap and easy to use so that we really could know how many cases there are and so that we could distinguish also between this novel coronavirus and the concurrent uh, flu that is circulating now with many symptoms in common. Uh, also, think how different it would be if we had a vaccine that could actually protect people from the, th the threat of infection as an outbreak unfolds. And also, we need to learn a lot more about how to manage the cases of this disease and, um, and what are the necessary tools uh, for effective uh, treatment. And um, I think, you know, one of the, the important aspects as we think about preparedness for the future is ensuring that we have the investments in the, the public health capacity that's needed, which has been underinvested in for years, um, and that we're also investing in the R&D that will enable us to harness all of the opportunities in science for more effective responses in the future. We do have just a few minutes left. Um, Perhaps there are some, some questions. There are microphones. We may not be able, we clearly will not be able to answer all questions, but keep your questions short and to the point, and we'll try to keep answers short and to the point as well. You were first. <coughs> Uh, thank you. I have a question for Scott. You mentioned that the changing of China's confirmation criteria quite recently from solely relying on the kit, nucleotide kit, to the screening, CT screening. And so I wonder, because, you know, there's a long time there's an supply of the kit, but now after the change, what is the implication of this change and how it can help prevent or what's the implication for the containment to the, uh, to, to the other strategy? Thank you. Sure, I can take a first crack at that. <clears throat> the issue was raised, if, if others couldn't hear, was uh, about this change. Trevor showed it, the jump in cases in, in China yesterday was because the case definition was changed from laboratory confirmed cases being reported to those cases plus cases that were diagnosed using primarily CT scanning of the lungs to identify possible cases. The implications for me there are two. Um, one, <laughs> it's just complicated as an epidemiologist to track things if the definition keeps changing. And so I think the World Health Organization took that approach and said, fine, it's going to take us a while to understand this change, but for today, that was yesterday, we're not going to count the new cases reported with the new definition. They just reported out the laboratory confirmed cases. So for the near future, I would anticipate continuing to track the laboratory confirmed cases. But the second implication is just a recognition that those lab confirmed cases are not keeping up with this outbreak. And it, it, this is an explicit recognition that there are many more cases out there getting sick, getting CT changes, and dying with this virus than are being tracked. And so I think bottom line for me is we take all of these numbers that we're seeing about the growth in the global uh, number of cases with a big grain of salt. And that at this, at this stage, that just adds to the uncertainty about this outbreak, where it is and where it's going. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ed Belanger, Marshfield Clinic Research Institute. Um, this is for Scott. Um, great presentations. Um, 
I want to ask about the case fatality rate. You mentioned 2 or 3%, but we don't really know the numerator or the denominator, right? Yeah. But one thing that is really striking is that, you know, most of those fatalities are in China. And, um, and my understanding is, outside of China, that the infections have been relatively mild. And in the U.S., there hasn't really been uh, as much serious disease as you would expect, looking at what appears to be going on in China. So. How much of that, what's your take on that, and do you think some of that is due to sort of an overwhelmed healthcare system in China that is just not able to provide care for people where with greater resources perhaps the fatality rate would be lower? Thoughts? Yeah, it's an important question, Ed, and you, you remember the, the H1N1 from Mexico where we were uh, hearing about very severe disease in Mexico, wards filled with pneumonia patients, and then in New York City and elsewhere people said, uh, oh, we're seeing a lot of cases, but most of them are mild. And it turned out it was more on the mild end. Um, so we all hope that that's the situation here. There's a couple things that give me pause, and then I actually would like Trevor to weigh in a little bit too. Um, one is uh, Li Wenliang. I mean, it, it kills a 34-year-old ophthalmologist. Now, that's not normal flu. I mean, that's, it's one case. It stands out, and I think we should, we should pay attention to some of these cases. Two, on the exported cases, I agree. They, they provided a very important window. They're in the range of 500 exported cases now. Up until yesterday, there was one death so in the Philippines. So one out of 500 gives you some reassurance. Well, then there's another death in Japan yesterday. So now it's two out of, that doubles the fatality outside. And remember what I was saying about the deaths taking 18 days to occur. So the exported cases are at least a few weeks, if not more, behind the cases in China. So I think it's early for us to make conclusions about what's the mortality going to be in those 500 or more cases that leave. I wanted to ask Trevor, because this really important question about how wrong is that denominator can be approached by phylogeny as well. And I know Trevor's done some thinking about that. Did you want to comment about? Are we underestimating the denominator by a five-fold or a hundred-fold or Thanks. hopefully more? Thanks, Scott. Um, on the kind of that first point about the, uh, the exported cases and severity, uh, there's a really nice bit of modeling work by Christian Altus where it's just because these things haven't had fully time to resolve themselves, you can actually still look at it as, as a censoring problem. And then there he's getting, it's, it's a wide range, but it is two out of 500 without time to resolve is putting it at something like 1% or, or end of that, of that range, maybe as a median. Uh, the, in terms of the total case burden, I think from the genomic data, you can say that it's not 100 times. Uh, that like 10x is, is possible, but not, not 100x in terms of the denominator. So that, that would push things more on the, the severe side. That's not a very good answer. <laughs> yeah, that's not what we were hoping. It's a good answer. It's a worrisome. Thank you. But the challenge is in this kind of a context, you're always working with uncertainty and partial data, but still having to make important decisions as you go forward. One last question, I'm afraid. So this question is partially about communication itself, and I think sometimes the science of doing it well doesn't get quite as much attention from public health authorities as the science of the medicine involved. And in the final presentation, when you were talking about how we should be preparing to help low-resource countries, I wondered if anyone is proactively thinking of innovative ways to do communication around social distancing. If the point-of-care model, if, if we need a radical rethinking of how to approach this, who's doing the radical rethinking of communication? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't know. Should we turn to you, John, as someone who specializes in communication? You communicate both to the public and to a more professional audience, but you also have a fairly good sense of what's happening in the broader community. It's, it's tricky. I mean, I, I speak science fluently, so I can delve into the molecular mechanisms of things. I can go um, much deeper than a lot of reporters can. Um, it's also a question of what the audience is interested in and how much detail you can go into for readers. And, uh, so we struggle with it. There, there is not an easy answer for it. Um, I, I do think one thing I wanted to mention is 
a few people have brought up, I think Scott and Trevor brought up the 47,000 number of total cases. It's now officially at 64,000. And that's how quickly this is moving. And, you know, we're racing to keep up with this. And so that flood of information, when you get into the details of what to communicate, it's, it's also about just trying to stay afloat. It's really moving quickly. Well, thank you for identifying a critical area for future work and activity. Communication is absolutely key. Um, I want to thank the terrific communicators on our panel for taking the time this morning um, to discuss this set of important issues. Thank you for your time and attention. Please join me in thanking the panel. Okay.